very pleased to, to be here and very honored to be uh, speaking at Tom's birthday celebration. Um, I could basically bag the talk, which you might be grateful for, and just tell stories about Tom, which I will attempt not to do. It's just that I, you know, like more or less everything, many things I had to say here sort of reminded me of something to do with Tom, but uh, maybe it just one little one just beforehand is maybe an expression of, of pleasure for the degree to which Tom has influenced uh, me and my work. And a lot of that has been because he's been in Boston. And one of the things I remember really clearly, although you'll probably contradict me because, because I, when I remember things clearly, they're probably not true, but, <laughs> but was when I was in Oxford, uh, I spent the year, the, the Cyber Gwinton year, 94, 95 there, which was a great experience, uh, visiting largely with Peter. And in the spring, Tom came to visit, and they, Peter and Tom were on the job market, if you can sort of imagine that, and, and uh, finally made their decision. And we went out, uh, they went out for lunch to celebrate, and I joined them, and we had a bottle of wine with lunch, which is, you know, not a really mathematician thing to do. And I do remember they toasted each other, and, you know, and, and because, they, you know, the, the, decision to, uh, to, to go to Harvard and, and, and MIT. And as I recall the toast, I don't know who said this first, but one of them, I think maybe Tom said, you know, thank you for making me a lot of money. <laughs> I think was, and the other one came back with the, with the same toast. So I was, uh, and you know, so they of course were very pleased, but I was probably more pleased than either of them because you know, the idea that you know, Gates theory was, well, of course Cliff was there already and it, it had a, uh, made a, a big impact, but the idea that Tom and Peter were coming to, uh, to, to, to Boston was great. And, and over the years, that's meant that there's been um, a million informal interactions and a million times when I've had a chance, you know, when I just, some point I'm stuck on or maybe a crazy idea that needed um, encouragement or shooting down as the case may be. And, uh, Tom was really good at that, so I, I, I hope to illustrate that point um, because it, it actually, one of the most striking instances of that, well, as you'll see, it, it wasn't the, the insight that Tom, I will explain a, a, a small point that Tom made to me that was a, a, a route around what seemed to be a very large stumbling block at the, at, at the time. So. I, I don't know whether you will remember the story, but it but certainly uh, looms large in my mind. In any case, this is a, a joint project with, uh, with Dave Ockley. We're, we're almost done. We had vowed to finish writing our paper by the end of the summer, and we might actually achieve that. I don't know. So we, we have 90% of a, or 95% written, depends on. Dave's supposed to be finishing one last little bit. So it might be long, so maybe it's more, more like 90%. In any case, we're almost done. So, okay, so the, Theme is actually uh, not so different, although different in techniques and, um, and intentions um, from what Dave talked about earlier today. And it has to do with the interaction between um, diffeomorphisms of four manifolds and uh, in, in a way in, with embedded surfaces and also embedded three manifolds. So let me uh, start with something which I assume everybody knows, but anyway, well, I'll say it anyway just to set the scene, uh, you know, by <laughs> the early 80s, Donaldson had given us examples of homeomorphic manifolds, smooth, smooth four manifolds, I probably should say four here, um, uh, manifolds which are not diffeomorphic. And here's a, a, a concrete example. Actually, th this isn't the concrete example that I want, but uh, let me start here with, the, uh, so I'll write V or V4 for the hypersurface degree four in CP3. Um, so there's an equation um, as a, Smooth manifold, uh, you can think of this in various ways. The, the, the K3 surface, um, uh, or an elliptic surface, which is somehow the, uh, the guise in which we'll, um, uh, we, we use it. We use the fact that it has elliptic vibration. Um, I, 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 although, you know, again, as I say, I'm, I, I'm easily distracted, as you'll see. So I can't help but, uh, so, so although this isn't exactly the example I want to discuss, of course, the existence of more than one smooth structure on the K3 surface is one of Tom's early and truly spectacular results. And one of the amazing things about that, of course, 
if, in, in actually in the, in the paper that he wrote with Bob Gump, is that the um, disjointness of the planes that Larry was referring to, the X1, X3, and X1, X4 planes, that plays a crucial role because that, what that tells you, if you think about it right, is that the K3 surface has uh, three different elliptic vibrations and that the, the, tora, the fibers in those cases are all disjoint. So you, you can do that on the, to, on the torus, and then that sort of descends down to the, to the K3 surface. So I, I thought that was just a funny coincidence that that exact, um, what's that? Is it a coincidence? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you tell me. I mean, or, but tell me afterwards, you know. So anyway, I thought that was, that, you know, just to see those, the, those same pairs of things written up on the board. I, I was rather amused by that. Any case, so here's the example I actually want to think about, um, uh, which is uh, um, probably, uh, I don't know, easier, but um, more directly taken. You don't have to do all this hard cutting and pasting things uh, to, to do this. So take, instead of uh, X itself, take uh, X, uh, sorry, instead of the K3 surface, take it uh, blown up once. So adding CP2 bar, so that, so that, I'll call that manifold X, and unfortunately there's a couple of things later on called X, but I hope those will be, it'll be clear that the, this one is really X, okay, so, um, so there's X, which is that's blown up K3 surface, and uh, that's, n the reason for the blow up is to make it not spin, and that's homeomorphic to another manifold um, in, in the same, uh, which is uh, three copies of CP2 and 20 copies of CP2 bar. Okay, so those are homeomorphic, uh, but they're not diffeomorphic. And the way you can tell them apart, by the way, uh, through the work of Donaldson, um, is that you that Donaldson defined for us these invariants. I'm just thinking of sort of the simplest Donaldson invariant, which would be a numerical invariant. Uh, so I'll just call it D uh, without any definition. So dx is some sort of is an integer. Um, so it's non-zero for x, the blown up K3 surface, but for this connected sum, um, Donaldson proved this connected sum theorem, which said that it, in fact it's zero. So those are different manifolds. Okay, so, uh, and the fact that they're, but on the other hand, Friedman told us they are uh, homeomorphic, so in fact they're a, an exotic pair of manifolds. Uh, Wall had proved, you know, in, you know, sort of, even before I was a student, um, Wall had proved uh, in, 1960, in, the, in the 60s, uh, in a series of seminal, uh, fundamental works, I should say, um, that um, homotopy equivalent manifolds were stably diffeomorphic. That's actually, his proof is sort of harder than it really needs to be. Uh, it's actually a pretty straightforward handle body argument. But in any case, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice argument, and in particular, um, if, if you add some number of S2 cross S2s, uh, you can turn x into y. If you add the same, their homotopy equivalent, so it would be the same number. Uh, actually, Mandelbaum, whose actually name I misspelled but forgot to correct, um, and Moishezan, uh, this I think maybe originally a result of Moishezan, but hard to understand and made comprehensible by um, Mandelbaum in the 1970s, in fact showed that in this and many, many similar examples, uh, you could take uh, k equals one. In other words, just one stabilization uh, suffices. And it, it's a, a, a wonderful and interesting problem whether that's true in general. I don't know an example of uh, homeomorphic manifolds, simply connected manifolds, where you need more than one stabilization. So someone knows, I, I, I have the microphone, you could. <laughs> Feel free to take over and do the lecture instead. Okay, so um, it's also true that uh, you could add uh, just a CP2, um, and uh, and they would become uh, diffeomorphic. So that's also uh, part of Mandelbaum and Moshezan's theory. So let me call. Actually, I don't think this is quite the right name, but so I want to think of. So I want to take X connects some CP2 and Y connects some CP2. And I want to think of them as the same manifold. So, so there really ought to be, and as we did it in our paper, there ought, ought to be sort of a choice of diffeomorphism between them. And when I identify them with the same manifold, I want that identification to have the following property. I'd like it to be, to, to look like it's uh, homotopically, uh, the, the, 
like a homeomorphism from X to Y and then a homeomorphism from CP2 to CP2. So put it more simply, I'd like the homology class of the uh, generator of H2 of CP2 here. Whatever diffeomorphism I choose, I want it to go there. So they, so they should be identified, but in such a way that the, the, the homologies are, are sort of kept track of. Okay, so those manifolds are the same, um, uh, but as I say, by Donaldson, so there's, a, of course, an important principle uh, that it matters that we're adding CP2, and if you added CP2 bar, they would remain distinct. Okay, so, <clears throat> so an important point about this is that, uh, and sort of maybe the beginning of the connection that I alluded to in my title, um, if you keep track of um, various submanifolds of Z, you can actually so, so you know, Z is sort of comes from X and comes from Y, but you can remember which one it came from if you remember a little more data. So the simplest data would be to remember um, a, a particular generator of the homology of, the, of this piece. Okay, so, um, so why, how is that? Well, this is a straightforward argument. Remember, whenever you have a sphere, an embedded sphere in a, a four-manifold of self-intersection, uh, plus or minus one, let's, uh, mainly we're going to use, uh, well, it doesn't matter, plus or minus one, but in this case, plus one, um, you can blow it down. So it's not really algebraic geometry blowing down. Dave insists on calling it anti-holomorphic blowdown, but he's not here, so I'm going to just call it blowdown. <laughs> if you're here, Dave, <laughs> online, don't, don't, don't interrupt. Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> So, and the point is, if you, if, you, if you add CP2 and then you blow it down immediately, you just get back to whatever your, your manifold was. So, in other words, the pair Z and the sphere coming from the X picture or the sphere coming, or the sphere coming, remembers X, and likewise the Z coming from the Y picture remembers Y. So, if you like, that pair is, um, so one point is that, they're, they're, that the pair is exotic. Uh, uh, because, in fact, this, there would be a homeomorphism taking one to the other. In fact, I'm, if you sort of just start with a homeomorphism from X to Y then, and extend it in the obvious way, it would have that property. Okay, so there, it, there, those, that's sort of an exotic pair of, of spheres. And as I say, um, those spheres remember X and Y. Um, you could also, instead of um, remember... Right, oh, oh, this is, did I have it before? So yeah, I, this picture will recur a few times. So, so the picture is somehow, um, like in, in this little bit here, there's a blue sphere that's supposed to be the one from X, and then there's a, a red sphere from Y. So uh, just to point out, those have um, algebraic intersection one, because they're, they're homologous, and then self-intersection is one, and, but they, they actually have to hit each other in a number of points. The simplest picture I know, they hit each other in five points. It's not hard to prove that they can't intersect in just one point. That's a fun exercise, that, that, that they must have sort of so-called excess intersection. Anyway, similarly, instead of thinking about the, the, the pair of the Z connect with either this X sphere or the Y, X two sphere or the Y two sphere, you could take Z with the, with the three sphere, which is the three sphere that sort of separates it into connected sum. So, so that also remembers, remembers things. So that's kind of a sidelight, but, but, but also sort of fun. So um, maybe another way of saying this is that, um, but again, those things are all topologically isotopic. So maybe I'll, I'll say it in a um, unnecessarily, so this is, of course, a well-known observation. I don't know who made it first, but, it, but it's sort of been around for, I don't know, a long time. Uh, but uh, let me just say it in a, in a way that perhaps provokes an obvious question, which is if you look at pi zero of the embedding space, and you know, I actually thank you, Dave, for sort of warming up the audience to, to be sensitive to things like homotopy groups of embedding spaces. Seems like a, that maybe that seems like a good thing to study. I don't know. So here's pi zero of the smooth embedding space mapping to um, pi zero of the um, topological space of topological, maybe locally flat embeddings, um, that's, not in, that's not injective, uh, or if you do the same thing for the three sphere. Okay, so, um, well, that's all about embeddings. How does that relate to diffeomorphism? So, as it turns out, the, 
so, and here I'm actually going back quite a ways, something, some 25 years um, uh, to older work of mine that says that there's another way to remember the X and Y, and that's through studying a certain diffeomorphism. So let me, again, I assume remind everybody that on CP2 you have complex conjugation um, that takes CP1 to CP1, and actually, I'm always going to take, do a little isotopy. So rho is the name, uh, is, is that's sort of for reflection or something like that, because writing bar as a map is just like problematic. I don't know. I have enough. Anyway, so, um, so rho is that map, but, but I'm going to isotop it so it's the identity on a, on a ball. So it's no longer an involution, but, but who cares? Okay. So, um, but it's supported as in is... Uh, on a neighborhood of the, of the CP1. So you can sort of imagine that ball as being maybe relatively uh, big. So supported on, I think I will say a few times, meaning like the places where it's not the identity. So I, I don't know if that's standard terminology. Okay, so, um, so you can do such a thing on any four manifold as long as you have a, a sphere of self-intersection plus or minus one. Um, again, I think these observations some sense go back to Wall's early work. Uh, so, and one, the, one easy way to say it is if you have, so th here this z and x are not the z and x. This is like any z that's a connected sum of, with either CP2 or CP2 bar. You can do the complex conjugation on the CP2 part extended by the identity of z and then you get a diffeomorphism which, um, so uh, well, just to emphasize, it really depends on the placement of this sphere. Okay, so again, a simple idea, but, 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 but crucial. So, so sort of informally, I'm sort of writing it as the identity on, on one part and then this complex conjugation on, on the other. Okay, so in um, my uh, theorem was that in, in the situation above, so now back to the X is now this, I forget what it was, the blown up K3 surface. Uh, it actually remembers the, the, the Donaldson invariant, and in lots of other circumstances. Uh, so actually, I'm gonna um, expand it all a little bit because it's the same principle, and um, what I just said is correct, but it's, it's, it's actually better instead. So here, I'm gonna change my notation, but now, now I'm done. You know, Z's and X's just mean what, they, what, they, what, what I'm writing here for, for, from now on. X is this blown up K3 surface, and uh, this is other manifold, which um, I wrote as M, which is CP2, and throw in a couple more CP2 bars for good measure. So if you like, you could have just sort of always added CP2, and then like instead of blowing up the K3 surface once, you could have blown it up three times. It sort of doesn't matter, but it's, it's awfully handy to do this. Um, okay, so uh, in that manifold, um, well, so what was my point? Of course, this is the same as uh, uh, Y connects them because there's a CP2 sum end. Or if you like, uh, this M, um, maybe I pointed out, right, this M is also, um, is also diffeomorphic to S2 cross S2 connects some CP2 bar. Um, so if you like the stabilization with S2 cross S2 is better than you can, either way you have the stabilization. Okay, so the Z has two identities um, and uh, it also has lots of spheres. So here's, one sort of generic, so M itself is, so let's look at M. Um, so there's the CP1, which I'll call H in, um, in CP2, and then in each CP2 bar, there's essentially a CP1, but I can't call them all CP1. So the one in the CP2 is H, and the other two are E1 and E2. So, for, so I can pretend I'm an algebraic geometer for, for a minute and call them exceptional spheres. Okay, so on, on, um, <coughs> on M, we could do this reflection. So I could do a reflection. In, so if I take H plus E1 plus E2, um, that has self-intersection of one, minus one. Or I could do a reflection in E1, or you know, I could do any number of compositions of reflections. Now, there's an important reason for doing this composition, um, which I, if I weren't like telling stories and getting all sentimental, I would probably explain more, but anyway, I won't. But anyways, so, um, but, so uh, the important part of this F, which is the composition of, of these reflections, is really the, the first part. 
because that's the one where I can sort of do it in terms of x or I can do it in terms of y, and I have, in principle, maybe different looking diffeomorphisms. So f, what it, so, so I have, um, I think something called, well, no, sorry, that's not alpha, excuse me. All right, so I could take the, I could, I could transplant all this onto, onto, um, onto z, either thinking of it as x connects some CP2 and a couple of CP2 bars, or I can transplant it onto z using the decomposition into s y. Okay, so, um, so now I'm going to, so this all provokes, so the, this all provokes a certain, again, a, a memory. Uh, so, so I'm going to drag you through this memory, and I don't know whether you will remember this, Tom, as, 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 as distinctly as, as, as I do. So, okay, so what's the, what's the, diff, what's the diffeomorphism I want to look at? So if you do this with um, sort of the x picture, and you do it with the y picture, and you compose the one with the inverse of the other, um, I'm going to call that alpha, okay? So that's by construction, that's uh, provably, that, well, that just acts as the identity on homology because the x sphere and the y sphere were homologous. And by uh, uh, work of and various people, um, that's homotopic and therefore topologically even isotopic to the identity. Um, so in, so in, in, you know, whenever, n years ago in the, in the 90s, I had defined Actually, I think I did it, worked on this when I was, during that spring in Oxford, and um, I defined this invari an invariant of diffeomorphism. So I will say something very brief about it if I have a minute at the end, but it's defined using one parameter gauge theory. So this is the Donaldson invariant version. There's a cyber invariant version. I don't know if there's a hagar fleur version, but probably there is, but I think it has some technical issues. Okay. and. The question was, okay, well, it's fun to define, it's fun to prove, it has various basic properties, um, but I wanted to construct um, examples. Well, I constructed it and I had, I had an example where, you know, it clearly should be non-zero and I wanted to calculate it. And um, so here was my original uh, idea. So this is this uh, thing in, um, in the box here, this sort of messy picture. That's supposed to be an example, that's supposed to be like the SX, I forgot which color is which. Uh, X is blue, so let's do blue. So this blue thing, this is Sx plus E1 plus E2. The E2, is, E1 and E2 are those, the, the black lines that are, that are cutting across. Okay, so, so what should I, so my idea was, well, I have this thing that involves an X sphere and a Y sphere, so I should take a regular, I should take the union of those spheres, and, and more or less nothing, you know, take the union of those spheres and um, um, kind of take a regular neighborhood of that and pull apart along that. So that would isolate all the interesting stuff on this one manifold, which is the regular neighborhood of a couple of spheres. Well, you know, that's kind of a complicated manifold. The bound, I mean, these days it's sort of more tractable with various other kinds of gauge theory. It's some kind of graph manifold and probably lots of things could be computed about. You know, th but you gotta remember, this is like 19, maybe 96 or so, five when I'm, when I'm thinking about this. And, and you know, that was a pretty hopeless manifold to, to, to think about. So I was, um, I was stuck, and I had, but I had some ideas where you sort of pulled apart about, along one and then somebody pulled apart on the other. And anyway, well, I was just not making progress, so, um, well, maybe I'll skip the argument uh, um, and, and, and tell the story and come back to the, to the argument. So, so I, I'm presenting it in the form of a, of a very short play. I always wanted to write a play and, you know, well, so this is my best. This is going to be it, you know. So if I don't win the whatever Tony Award for this, I'm out of luck. Okay, so there are two. It's a play in one act with one scene in Tom's office. Uh, you could guess who the, the players are. So, you know, so here's my... So my line, first line is, uh, you know, well, hey, Tom, you know, I, I'm kind of stuck on this. The, the boundary of this neighborhood is really um, complicated, and it's, just, I don't know what to do with it. And, and so Tom says, well, this is kind of a fantasy recollection of this. I have no idea if, what he said. But, you know, he said, well, do you know how to calculate the two separate, you know, this, the, this invariant for uh, 
the sort of the X piece and the one for the Y piece. And I said, but yeah, sure, I, I know how to do that. And he said, well, do you have a composition law? And you know, I had already done that. I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. He said, well, why aren't you done? Well, so okay, so, so that's 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 the end of the play. And you know, so so well, I mean, so what do you learn from this story? Well, um, you learn that um, sometimes you could be really stupid, and uh, you also learn that sometimes, like a simple observation, is really really crucial. So this was a very simple observation, but it was really crucial because, and, and here's you know, like here's what it. Here's what it happens. You, you notice that this, this, E1, this E1 thing, which is actually crucial to the, important to the, to the calculation. Um, when you, and, and in fact, the, my original version of this had a different composition. So it's not quite this. So this is, again, complete revisionist history. Um, but who cares? Um, so uh, the point is that with this, with this row E1 stuck in there, uh, which was in there in, in, in the first version of all this, um, there's this, there's a, there is a Donaldson invariant for this piece. It's a little tricky because it's not, doesn't act trivially on homology, but, it, but, it, but it, anyway, there is one there. And there's uh, um, this, likewise, uh, the Donaldson invariant for this piece is, is defined. And uh, there's a composition law, which says that the invariant for a composition is the sum. Well, this one, you notice there's an inverse, so that actually turns it into a minus sign. So I get the invariant for the one defined using x and the one defined using y. And the key calculation, um, which is in my paper, well, with, with a factor of four, but I've somehow simplified it, so it's, it's actually, a, it's a slightly different diffeomorphism, so it's actually a factor of two. Um, for y, it's kind of clearly zero. Well, the point is, it's what the, what's, what's the actual calculation is that the invariant for f of this form is simply the Donaldson invariant of, of the manifold, the underlying manifold or the manifold without the, without the CP2 on it, okay? And likewise, the Donaldson invariant for Y is the Donaldson, in, for the diffeomorphism defined in terms of Y is the Donaldson invariant uh, of the underlying manifold Y itself. So in that sense, the diffeomorphism remembers the, uh, remembered that Donaldson invariant. It's actually an interesting question to me as to whether it, like, the, the spheres actually remembered the manifolds. So I don't know whether the diffeomorphism remembers the manifold in the same sense. I mean, but as far as the invariant that tells them apart, these two, this pair apart, um, it, it remembers them. In any case, so if you choose the right x, then you get uh, one part zero, the other part's not zero, and, uh, and, and then you're done. And um, so this works for blown up CP2, oh, sorry, blown up E2, it works for lots of other examples. And uh, okay, so there things stood. Um, Oh, we've seen the play. Uh, seen the movie? Is that, that? Anyway, okay. So, uh, so somewhere around, so I presented this, I think probably the first time I presented it, well, first time I presented it correctly in public. I had presented it incorrectly before, but the first time I presented this correctly in public was at um, Rob Kirby's birthday conference in 1998. And um, Dave Ockley was there, and Dave had, was talking about a whole gang of results. He was quite interested in um, the stabilization results, you know, proving that things are, are stably diffeomorphic. So we got to talking, and we agreed on the principle that one ought to be able to do this for um, higher homotopies. And, and how should you do it? Well, basically, our, the idea was if you had, so remember, all this depends on these two two spheres. So over here is the x sphere, over here is the y sphere. So suppose you added maybe another s2 cross s2, and suppose you could prove that the x sphere and the y sphere became isotopic. Well, that would give you an isotopy between the, the x diffeomorphism and the y diffeomorphism. So that would give you probably an interesting path from one thing to another. But, so that was an idea. So we thought, well, so that, you know, of course, that's, it's nice to have paths, but if you wanted to show pi 0, oh, sorry, pi 1 of something, you need not a path, but a, but a loop. Okay, so so we were a little so so we had two problems. One was um, showing that spheres became stably isotopic, and the other was showing and, and then coming up with something maybe a little more clever than just taking this path, taking the path in such a way, cooking up a path that closed up, so we would actually get a, a loop. So anyway, that's what, that's what, so the 
So let me state the theorem. So at least I've stated a theorem by the end of the talk. So this is sort of a, uh, a theorem that contains, I think, it's not everything in the paper, but, it, but, it, but it's a lot. So, so, so remember there was this manifold Z before. Z is going to be the first, it, it's, it's got two indices. And so what are the two indices? There's a K, which is going to tell you something about the ZKs have something to do is going to, I'm going to tell you something about pi k of their diffeomorphism groups. And then there's an r, and that tells you how big pi k is. So, so let's just, we, we just read it. So, so for any k and r greater than or equal to 1, I f we find manifold z k r and um, uh, uh, interesting embeddings of two spheres in those manifolds and also three spheres. So, and all of these groups have um, z to the r subgroups. And actually, many of them have uh, z to the r summands. Okay, so, um, so what are those? So the, the, the one, the, sort of the basic example is, so pi k of the diff 0, diff 0 meaning the identity component <coughs> of the, of the <laughs> not, not, not listening, <laughs> the identity component of, of the diffeomorphism group. Um, uh, and or, or uh, so that's sort of the, the basic construct. That the construction is there. Uh, we prove that they that they survive into um, the homology. So they're non-trivial. So if you think about the um, the, the, the homology, the, the, the Hravitz map from homotopy to homology. So they survive as homology elements. And um, you know, if you think about the whatever the universal bundle, that would give you elements in pi k plus one of B diff of the B of diff zero, uh, but those are actually homology elements in B of diff zero. So, uh, so all those groups are, all those things are non-zero. And sort of, so that was sort of the, that's sort of the basic, so the, the construction is sort of here and the detection is in some sense here. Okay, so, so, it, so, so the point is that you're getting interesting elements, but they're spherical families. If you like, if we're building families of four manifolds, uh, and their their families over a sphere, and that's so. Um, okay, that's 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 sort of the con constructive part, and and all those things are are distinct in um, in the rel in the groups that I mentioned, and while we're at it, we get um, uh, uh, non-trivial elements in um, pi k of the embedding spaces uh, for either the two spheres, so sort of like the two spheres I mentioned, or uh, pi k of the uh, of the three spheres. Uh, again, uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned, and those also survive into homology groups. So the fact that you're getting something in pi k is also a bit related to, to, to Dave's talk because, you know, there's all these vibrations relating um, homotopy groups and, 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 uh, and so on. It's actually not coming directly out of that, but it's sort of morally uh, in that same way. And um, one, of, uh, Dave, one of Dave's PhD students, Josh um, Druin, um, actually modified our construction so it works with spheres of uh, self-intersection bigger than one or uh, not equal to plus or minus one. And, uh, and, uh, and then the same, the, so the three manifold then would be the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of that, so some lens spaces. So he gets sort of similar looking results um, a, a, out of ours. Okay, so, uh, oh yes, yeah, so I say, oh yeah, so what are the, um, what are some addenda to, the, to, this, um, to this theorem? So as I said, the, um, at least for diff zero, you're getting um, um, a, a summand, a z to the r summand. Um, and a, so that sort of follows just by the construction, because these are, you know, it's kind of the usual thing. They're coming, they're detected by a homomorphism to something, and, and which has got, you know, which is a free abelian group, and then so, any case, it just sort of that's it's just some some, some algebra. Um, uh, more maybe more interesting is that, or more interesting to me is that all of these things are trip. If you passed, I didn't want to write it all down, but if you passed to the topological category, in other words, if instead of writing diffeomorphisms you wrote homeomorphisms, instead of writing embeddings you wrote topological embeddings, all these things become trivial, um, and all of them, 
sorry, not in the sum n, because the sum n just somehow have to expand a subgroup, but all the things in the subgroups that we detect um, uh, become trivial after a single stabilization. So in other words, the families of embeddings become trivial families of embeddings after you add a single S2 cross S2, the diffeomorphisms become um, trivial families of diffeomorphisms after you add a single S2 cross S2. And um, in fact, that property Sort of that's, as I said, as I tried to suggest earlier, that property is kind of the key to the whole thing. Uh, may I say one other point about the topological category? You know, in, for pi zero, in other words, for isotopy, there's a very clear criterion for when two homeomorphisms of simply connected manifolds are, are isotopic, which is that they're so-called pseudo-isotopic, which follows from them being homotopic, which follows from just them you know, uh, inducing the same map on, in homology. So that's really, oh, it's a, it's a very hard theorem, by the way. I don't know. I know very few people who've read the proof of that one, but um, it, including me, <laughs> I have to say, um, or remember it anyway. But, um, uh, uh, but there's no such principle for these higher homotopy groups. So somehow the, the topological triviality of all these things has to get boosted up along with the interesting constructions. So, and all of that goes, through, goes via this, um, this stabilization. So um, let me um, say a few words about that. So this is just the same picture I had before. Instead of having K and R, I have Z. Well, I used to have Z, but it's, you know, it's the first of, the, uh, of, of all those. So it would be the Z, zero, one. Okay, so, um, so again, we have this, um, this diffeomorphism preserving things sort of homologically. And, and actually, um, a small point, we could preserve the CP2 bars on the nodes because we could have done the, I was gonna hold my hands over the screen here. That, that didn't really work. Uh, we, we could find those, uh, those diffeomorphisms even without uh, the CP2 bars there. Okay, so, so uh, in, in the service of this, uh, of this goal of finding these higher homotopy groups. Uh, uh, Dave and I were talking about this um, <coughs> problem of stable isotopy of submanifolds, and we worked with uh, Hee Jung Kim and Paul Melvin, and uh, we proved that they uh, that those spheres. So this is a general, a more, more general theorem, but but in this particular instance, as we sort of worked on this. We worked out this one example because we were interested in it. Um, that this, that the, the sphere Sx and Sy are smoothly isotopy, iso, excuse me, isotopic if you add an S2 cross S2, or if you add a CP2, or, you know, just because you threw in some more stuff, in, in, uh, if you added a copy of M. Um, so that's by a very explicit um, iso, isotopic, and uh, so isotopy, and it follows from that construct, from that, uh, from what we did is that the, that the diff diffeomorphisms you get are therefore isotopic. Okay, so, the, so oh, sorry. So, so let's think about just adding M. So we're gonna add all the things. I'm gonna add CP2 and I'm gonna add S2 cross S2 and you know, so every, everybody's happy. So, um, so the construction, so let me at least indicate how you go from pi zero to pi one. I think I could, yeah, I think we're, we're okay with that. And then, uh, so, one of the, con a consequence of the explicit stable isotopy from the paper with um, uh, David and Hee Jung and, and, and Paul um, is that in fact, um, the isotopy between this, those spheres all takes place in the complement of a torus of self-intersection zero. So remember that the, the, this manifold started out as being uh, an elliptic surface blown up. So there's lots of torus. You can sort of take a torus and sort of send it off into the corner and it just will stay there the, the whole time. So that's extremely handy for, for any number of reasons, but in particular it's handy for this. Um, so because, so what we're gonna do is just take two of those. Do I have a picture? Oh, here's a picture. Take two copies of this Z or the Z01 and do a fiber sum. So remove a neighborhood of T2 cross D2, um, and in each, and, and, and glue them in some uh, obvious way. So uh, this is, uh, you know, artist's conception. Anyway, uh, you can, it, somehow the, 
it's not really getting flipped over, but that's 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 the best I could do uh, here. Okay, so so you so you glue a couple of them together, and um, so let, let's just look at the, at the, at this the sort of final picture. So so notice that that's got two copies of this M in it, right? This sort of the left one in in this picture. This again, left and right don't really make much sense here. And then there's the right copy of M, and the right copy of M has in it some two spheres. It has some copies of C, it has some sum ends of CP2 or S2 cross S2. So I can use the right copy of M to kind of clean up the, um, the, the, uh, the spheres in the left copy of M. Okay, so in other words, what does that mean? That means in this picture, there's, a, uh, there's an isotopy uh, between those spheres and therefore, if I uh, go down here, this, uh, uh, this this diffeomorphism um, um, that's sort of supported on the left part is after I add on this other part, uh, the, the, the second copy of Z, I've made the whole thing a lot bigger, by the way, of course. Um, that's isotopic to the identity on, the, on this manifold Z11. Okay, so that was sort of the scheme I was saying where I said, okay, let's add an S2 cross S2, but we added more, okay, and that's, it's, again, it's sort of technical thing that comes out of the uh, computation. So let me call F the isotopy that you, that you get in this fashion. Okay, so again, it's, we sort of want to use the explicit one that, that, that we used. Okay, so here's the, uh, so I, this is the, gen, I'm suggesting a general comp, sort of inductive uh, thing. So imagine, a, you know, think of a sphere in, in, the, in, in this way. So, you know, you take a sphere across I, and it's basically I'm making the, reduce suspension, you know, you add a cone point, cone point, and then you collapse and, and arc. And if you think about that, um, just sort of, you know, so again, we have sort of two variables. We have an isotopy F sub T, and then um, you just sort of, uh, in each T, you, you make this commutator, okay? So literally commutator in terms of, you know, as, as commutators of diffeomorphisms. Anyway, what you see, uh, that's actually a loop just because, you know, sort of up at the end, various things commute. At one end, you have an identity. At the other end, the things you have commute. So, so um, you're getting, a, a, you're getting, if you like, you're getting a path from the identity, to an interesting path from the identity to itself. So it's the same thing I said earlier. It's just that with this kind of tweak to make it into the, uh, to make it into to a loop. And then, well, so then you could kind of imagine the scheme. So, okay, we have to, have to discuss in a second, um, a very short second, um, uh, you know, how you're going to compute the invariant, uh, you know, what kind of invariant might detect this, but you can imagine a similar sort of scheme. Okay, you add another copy of this Z, which it, among other things adds a copy of uh, this sum ends of CP2 and S2 cross S2. That using a similar device, which I didn't tell you, um, would then create a, a, a contraction of this loop and by a very similar commutator construction, that would build you an element in pi two. And then, well, that one would be stably trivial. That would build you a, a contraction in, that would, the, the contraction using this commutator construction builds you something in pi three and so on. And so that, that's, the, that's the construction. That's the sort of making the k's bigger, making the r's bigger. You just, it's just kind of like, you know, we're supposed to be, <laughs> knowledge about four manifolds. You just add some more junk on and make more basic classes, so to speak. So I won't, I won't do all that. So let me say in the last few seconds, so how do you detect all these things? Well, um, as, so here's just sort of a step-by-step. Uh, a, a, a step. So, you know, as I said, you know, Donaldson taught, taught us how to um, compute invariance of manifolds. So that was in terms of a generic metric. You count points in some moduli space. You organize it so that it has virtual dimension zero, perturbed, so it really is a, is a zero manifold oriented. Count them. Okay, what about one parameter invariance? Uh, so to detect pi zero, so this again is old work of mine. You have a diffeomorphism, you choose a generic metric, you pull it back, connect them by a path, and you've organized things. Um, it's not clear necessarily until you do the arithmetic that. Uh, you can form a one parameter moduli space, which would be a zero dimensional object. You can count points in that, and that's an invariant of the isotopy class of your diffeomorphism. So that's what I uh, cooked up years ago. 
And it was, again, clear at the time, but I didn't, had no idea how to calculate it. You could do something similar if you have a, uh, a k-spheres worth of diffeomorphisms of some manifold. This is back, x is back to being any old manifold with the right homological invariant so that, uh, so again, what do you do? You have a k-spheres worth of diffeomorphisms. You pull back a k-spheres worth of, you get a k-spheres worth of metrics, but the space of metrics is contractible. So you fill that in with a k plus one ball and you count points in a k plus one parameter moduli space. And that's an invariant. And then the fine, let me just say the last theorem, well, the theorem is, uh, again, an inductive calculation using this particular alpha and that particular commutator construction um, is that the, this one parameter, well, so um, this was kind of my original calculation said in slightly different language, is that the, that the Donaldson invariant for the original diffeomorphism is the difference between the Donaldson invariant in, of x and y. And in general, if you take, uh, uh, take do at the kth stage, you take sort of the, the kth family built in this way is the, the Donaldson invariant for that is twice the Donaldson invariant for the, uh, for the one at the previous stage. So I don't know. Um, yeah, let me just skip all that and go, go to the last thing. So, you know, and, and again, this is straight out of the, uh, the, the paper I wrote in, I guess, published in 98. Um, so it was the, 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 the sole acknowledgment. And really, this is sort of in some, I, I, I'd like to thank myself for say, writing a good acknowledgment because it really hits, hits the, I think, the nail on the head. You know, so, so, I, so Tom listened to this uh, complicated version, you know, with me babbling and you know, drawing all over the board and just ask the right question. It's, it's uh, quite a gift and um, thank you. So I'll turn. So the, the question was uh, relate, referred to um, work of Donaldson and Sullivan who showed that actually the original Donaldson theory would work just fine to show that non, these non-diffeomorphic manifolds detected by you know, Donaldson theory, so to speak, are not quasi-conformally, which is weaker than smooth, so I guess in the, um, uh, uh, Quasi, so they're not quasi-conformally diffeomorphic. So the question was, is, does our work show that these, are, that these diffeomorphisms are not quasi-conformally isotopic? And I, I guess so, but I don't know. I, I, I would assume so, but uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about it. Yeah, it seems. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, I, yeah, and I suppose so there's, I, I, I don't know, is there a category of quasi-conformal embeddings and, you know, all that? So, yeah, I, 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 I would suppose so, but I, I don't know. It's a, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I don't know. Oh, so... Yeah, well, so... Tom makes a comment that uh, that paper, which is an, an intimidating paper, a, a sophisticated paper to say the least, it's, um, is um, it's not necessarily known to work for like the full glory of Donaldson invariance, which involves um, uh, you know uh, poly, you know poly, you. It's a poly, it gives you polynomials and so on. So there's a whole bunch of other technical stuff you'd have to get to work. Um, the, I should say um, that the pi zero version of this works to give polynomial invariance. Um, the higher homotopy version, I don't know um, how to do the polynomial. The, I don't know how to do uh, the version with, with uh, cutting down moduli spaces and stuff like that, just because You'd sort of anyway. You'd have to study families of cutting things down, and actually, that's it's 
it, it's problematic. I don't want to try to explain it, but it's, but it's, prob it's, certainly, it's, it's conceptually problematic as well as I have no idea how to do it. So, yeah. Um, um, almost, so the question is, what's the behavior of these things under adding CP2 bar? Under, so not the blow up, which I said, or the anti, for Dave, the, not you, the other, Dave Oakley, the anti-holomorphic blow up kills things. Uh, it's presumably the case that the other, the, the actual kind of blow up um, preserves all these invariants. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's, that, that's true. We, we, we're just trying to get the damn thing done, so we haven't, we haven't done um, things like that. I should say, by the way, um, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to ask and uh, related to the point about these polynomial invariants. For instance, if we could get all the polynomial things to work, uh, we could probably prove that you could take the k to be, uh, sorry, the r to be infinity. So, you know, it's a good question. Should, all these things should have z infinity subgroups or some ands or Stuff like that. I, I I don't know how to prove it. Yeah. So this is this is very much. Uh, so for instance, especially the so one of the reasons I was keen um, to prove results about the homology of B diff or B diff zero. Um, so our results are about B diff zero homological stability. So there's a whole theme about, I mean, it's not just one of these weirdo four manifolds things to study. You know, in high dimensions, they study um, diffeomorphism groups and classifying spaces and families of manifolds. And there's uh, very strong patterns of how things behave under connect sum with, in that case, would be SN cross SN so in, in even dimensions. And um, sorry, this is, uh, and, um, so we, I wanted to sort of say, well, you know, the four-manifold thing is really different. We don't have homological stability. And in some sense, we don't have homological stability, or we have the opposite of homological stability, because things die, for the group diff zero. But, um, but that doesn't quite match what the high-dimensional people are doing. Yeah, but it's still, but the invariance, you really need the diff zero, or, or I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's a little bit, um, I'm not quite sure how this fits with the homological stability in high dimensions. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, so the question is, uh, so, so the question is, uh, uh, thank you for making that observation because I was supposed to say it which is that like all these manifolds are about as trivial as can get. So they're, 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 they're sort of maybe not the manifolds one wants to study. You know, by the time you're done with these constructions, you have, they're, first off, they all have, they have trivial Donaldson, Seiberg, what, written any kind of invariance. They're connected sums of CP2s and CP2 bars. So they're not exciting manifolds from any point of view. So um, there are lots of, there's lots of work by, assortment of people, um, Baraglia, Kono, um, Smirnov, I, I, I can't name everybody off the top of my head, although we have a lot of references in the papers, um, that construct uh, not so much pi zero, but, uh, uh, but um, elements in, say, pi one of the diffeomorphism groups of various interesting manifolds, like algebraic surfaces. As far as I know, uh, like even S pi one of diff of S two cross S two in the paper of Smirnov, uh, Gleb Smirnov, very nice paper. Uh, but those diff those families are actually uh, non trivially non trivial sort of homotopically. In other words, those are uh, those the, the bundles, if you like, that you make out of them are are not even are not trivial. They're not topologically trivial, for instance. So uh, so the problem of finding in, so there are the interesting examples, and of course, this, uh, as Dave alluded to this morning, there was uh, the work of Watanabe, who does this on S4, which is sort of, you know, in some sense, like, really what you want to be doing. Uh, none of this says anything about, about all that. But, um, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know how to make our method work for um, manifolds with uh, non-trivial invariants. And there, there, are, there is work of other people that does this. Um, well, there's the work of Tom and Peter, which, you know, which does K3 connects on K3, and, 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 and the work of Jianfeng Ling, which proves that that element is actually uh, stable under connects on with S2 cross S2. So, th so, that, so the sort of conjecture that one stabilization is enough is not true for diffeomorphism, which caught me entirely by surprise. So another great problem, not really connected to anything I said today, is you know, how many S2. So it's known that some number of S2 cross S2 would do that. That's the theorem of Quinn. Um, so yeah, there's lots of interesting questions about all this. <laughs>